Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I have a few different things to share with you, uh, all of which I think are pretty interesting. I have a new entry on my quotes prophecy fulfillment spreadsheet where somebody in general conference said that a prophecy has been fulfilled or is in fulfillment as we speak. So we're going to go over that. I have a new spreadsheet called quotes prophecy modern day where I realized that uh, aside from the scriptures, there are prophecies in our own time that have been given. And I want to try and capture all of those. And I would invite you to send me any that you know of, and I'll add them to this spreadsheet. It's in chronological order. So far, I have three, and I'll share that with you in a little bit. Um, I've done some more work on this spreadsheet, quotes, prophecy, fulfillment too, where I'm trying to see when was the last time that somebody said that prophecy still has to be fulfilled before the second coming. Um, I have a, one new quote on here because this particular column is going to take a long time to do, but at least I have one for right now. And then I've searched these three terms and I'll show you what that's all about. Then I have a couple new quotes that I've added to my uh, quotes, common misconceptions spreadsheet. One that has to do with the Antichrist and then the other one having to do with uh, New Jerusalem being built in Jackson County, Missouri. Both of these quotes for, come from Millennial Messiah. And what do you know? There's a rocket attack going on right now as I'm uh, starting this intro. And uh, it is near Tel Aviv. And it's getting bigger. Um, oh, and it's getting bigger. So just a little while ago, there was a rocket attack, and it's actually the second largest rocket attack that I've seen. And when I say second largest, I'm talking about the number of sectors that show up on these maps. So I don't I don't know about like the number of of rockets, uh, just the number of alerts. So that's what I'm referring to. And it looks like this is on the bigger side as well. What's happening right now? Uh, but this one is from just a little while ago. Uh, about a little bit, about an hour ago from the time that I'm recording this. And by the way, I'm recording this on Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Time. So this attack that you see right here, from the time that I, and I've pretty much been observing this the whole time, ever since the war started, uh, this is the second largest one that I have seen. The largest one uh, was a 32-line attack. Uh, referring to the number of like lines right here. I don't count up all the sectors and cities and, and towns and stuff like that, just the lines. So this one is a 21, and the largest one that I've ever seen was a 32. And then the third largest, 15. Okay, so this is a, pr a pretty significant attack, and it's taking place today. It probably has to do with the fact that the ground invasion seems to be kind of starting or at least like like they've said we're in a new phase right now uh in the war and so i'm guessing it probably has something to do with that but let's go back here looks like this attack is probably over so we might come back to this in just a minute but let me continue with what i was saying so um i just the way that it worked as i was preparing for this video is i kind of went off on this tangent having to do with the millennial messiah and bruce r mcconkey i've talked about before you know there's a lot of things that only bruce r mcconkey has said and i've gone over the quotes talking about how doctrine of the church um, is established by m multiple uh prophets and apostles it's spoken by many that's not to say that what he said was wrong but uh we also know, and hopefully you have this sense, it seems that Bruce R. McConkie was, in fact, uh, special. And that's why he talked on some of these lesser talked about uh, doctrines of the church. And so what I wanted to do was kind of uh, show you a few things that I found out about Bruce R. McConkie. And then uh, also talk specifically about the book Millennial Messiah and how much it is quoted uh, by church leaders. In various uh, locations, I have some quotes about it and uh, some interesting things to show you. Uh, and, and I'm doing this because, you know, I have a lot of quotes that come from Millennial Messiah a lot uh, because he basically talks about everything that has to do with the second coming. And so I think it's important to understand just how uh, valid 
uh, this book is viewed by the leadership of the church. And so we're going to get into that. Okay, let me go back here. Okay, the alert is done. So here's the one that I was talking about 53 minutes ago. This is the 21 line attack. And these are the lines that I'm referring to right here. Da, 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 da. There's 21. And this one is this one right here. So we'll see what happens over the weekend. I'm going to schedule this on Monday. So you may already know at this point. For all I know, maybe the ground, the full ground invasion will have started by then. Okay, so anyway, let's get uh, back to the beginning here. Got this uh, email from Shane Driggs. Uh, subject line for your prophecy fulfillment tab. Yes, so I, I invite anybody, if you have any that you want to share for me to put on this spreadsheet or anything else, uh, please send it my way, preferably by email. So thank you, Shane Driggs. Um, I've added it here. This is a scripture uh, that's found in Doctrine and Covenants. Let me zoom in. So the scripture is D&C 88, verse 73. Behold, I will hasten my work in its time. And then let me go to the actual talk on the church's website. This is from uh, Elder S. Gifford Nielsen, Hastening the Lord's Game Plan, and he is of the 70. And he says, Have we been listening? All over the world, stakes, districts, and missions are experiencing a new level of energy, as the Savior's declaration to Joseph Smith in 1832 is being fulfilled. And that's the key phrase right there, is, is being fulfilled. Behold, I will hasten my work in its time. Brothers and sisters, that time is now in italics. I feel it, and I'm sure you do also. So I want to explain something, and this is my own, you know, personal opinion. Um, when it comes to prophecy being fulfilled, I think that it's just as good that something is currently being fulfilled as having been fully fulfilled. The reason why is because as we're thinking about the second coming, and there's people that say, no, uh, this cannot happen yet because this is not yet fulfilled or it's not completed. The problem with that is you don't know when it's going to be completed. So for something kind of more on the ambiguous side like this, a, a generic thing like the Lord's work is hastening. Well, for all you know, maybe it's going to be full, considered by the Lord fully completed today or tomorrow or at any time. So if it's currently under fulfillment, then I don't see any reason why it can't be just any time, literally any time that it's fully fulfilled. And so that's why I have it here on this uh, spreadsheet. And then over in column R, or sorry, column H, credit to Shane Driggs for sending me the, the email. Sorry, let me format this a little bit better like that. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next thing. So here's the new spreadsheet that I was talking about where I'm going to um, collect as many prophecies in modern times as possible. Now, I already covered this in a previous video or a recent video, but um, I'm not sure too many people watched that video and that's fine. So this is a prophecy having to do with World War I. And uh, it's a prophecy by Wilford Woodruff, who at the time was president of the church. Um, this specific quote, I'm actually taking from a talk by Harold B. Lee, October 1951 General Conference. But uh, the original prophecy can be found in uh, the Young Women or the Young Woman's Journal, as well as the Improvement Era, volume 17, pages 1164 to 1165. Okay, so... Again, th this is Harold B. Lee talking, and then he gives the actual quote that relates to the prophecy, okay? He says, The responsibilities of the prophets in every dispensation has been to sound a warning for the nations to repent and to come unto the Lord and avoid the judgments that otherwise will be sent upon mankind. President Wilford Woodruff, in a sermon de delivered to temple workers in Brigham City in June 1894, 
made a remarkable prediction and a statement with regard to these matters. A part of his sermon is as follows. And by the way, the occasion right here is um, the year before the Salt Lake Temple had been uh, dedicated. And at that time, he said that the four angels in the book of Revelation that uh, had to be held back until the 144,000 were sealed in their foreheads, that those angels were released. Um, and it was at the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple. And this is recorded in a few different places. Joseph Fielding Smith talks about it. I've done videos about it. Okay, so what happened is the next year, there was a, a temple workers uh, excursion uh, that they went on. And in this case, they were up in Brigham City as part of the excursion. And a lot of what was said was written down and put in the Young Woman's Journal as well as the Improvement Era. Okay, the quote. We cannot draw a veil over the events that await this generation. No man that is inspired by the spirit and power of God can close his ears and his eyes or his lips to these things. When I have the vision of night open continually before my eyes and can see the mighty judgments that are about to be poured out upon this world, when I know these things are true and are at the door of the Jew and Gentile, while I know they are true, while I am holding this position before God and this world, can I withhold my voice from lifting up a warning to this people and to the nations of the earth? And then later, um, it skips down. And from this very day, uh, they shall be poured out. Calamities and troubles are increasing in the earth. And there is a meaning to these things. And then it skips down some more. Read the scriptures and the revelations. They will tell you about these things. Great changes are at our doors. Now, this is the key part right here. The next 20 years will see mighty changes among the nations of the earth. So this is the really the prophecy that I'm referring to and uh, that Harold B. Lee is referring to. The next 20 years. So again, the year is 1894. You will live to see these things, whether I do or not. I felt oppressed <clears throat> by, sorry, I've been, I have felt oppressed with the weight of these matters, and I felt that I must speak of them here. It is by the power of the gospel we shall escape. That's the end of the quote. Uh, he enumerated a number of the calamities which had been, which he had foreseen, and then said, quote, they are at our doors and not even this people will escape them entirely, end quote. 20 years later, as he predicted, lacking one month, the Great World War of July 1914 broke out in all its fury. Many, many of you here have been witnesses of the fulfillment of what President Woodruff said. And from that time to the present time, there has been an increasing intensity of the troubles and difficulties upon the earth. He sounded a note of comfort and blessing, however, in his closing statement. Remember this and reflect upon these matters, he said. If you do your duty and I do mine, we shall have protection and shall pass through the afflictions in peace and safety. This is something that a lot of people ignore and they choose to uh, be fearful and scare others at the same time. The key is to be righteous. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to be spared, but as a as you know, in large part, the righteous will be spared and have protection and have peace and safety. Um, remember and remember this too, uh, what he said up here. Um, where did it go? Um, oh right, right here. And not even this people will escape them entirely. So here we have a practical example of what that actually means. So right here, he's, uh, it seems that he's mostly referring to World War I, but other things too, other calamities. But he says specifically 20 years. And 20 years later, World War I happens. And it's true. Not all Latter-day Saints uh, escaped that entirely. There were Latter-day Saints that were a part of World War One and World War Two, and you know earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and all this stuff. So that's what it looks like. And I, th I get the feeling that some people think that um, it's certain that we're going to you know be caught up in like these horrible things. 
and it's not certain. This is what it looks like. Some some people are going to go to war. Some people are going to experience a disaster in their area. But the majority of the church and the righteous are going to be spared. They're going to be protected. They're going to be saved. And it's going to be the great day of the Lord for them. And for the wicked, it's going to be the dreadful day of the Lord. But some people will experience some of these uh, judgments and these things. It's as simple as that. Okay, the next one, we have to go to the year 1951. <clears throat> this was a prophecy by George Albert Smith. And uh, this is also Harold B. Lee uh, talking about a prophecy that he made. This is the same talk, by the way, uh, from what we were just reading. Shortly after the General Conference a year ago, last April, I met a man on the street who was inclined to be critical of the fact, he said, that the church was not receiving revelations. And why was it that the Lord wasn't revealing his mind in his will to his leaders? <laughs> I happen to have in my pocket a clipping from President George Albert Smith's last address, and I took it out and read this to him. Said President Smith at the April conference just one year before his death, quote, Brethren and sisters, let us go to our homes, and if our houses are not in order, let us set them in order. Let us renew our determination to honor God and keep his commandments, to love one another, to make our homes the abiding place of peace. Each of us can contribute to that in the homes in which we live. It will not be long until calamities will overtake the human family unless we seek uh, speedy repentance. It will, not, it will not be long before those who are scattered over the face of the earth by millions will die like flies because of what will come. So here, here's the prophecy right here. It will not be long before those who are scattered over the face of the earth, um, scattered over the face of the earth by millions will die like flies because of what will come. Now, that's a pretty ominous sounding statement. And I know people that will instantly take that to mean nuclear war or um, some kind of like disease or something like that. And we don't know. We don't know. But you know what? Given the pattern of prophecy, um, I would tend to think that maybe this has already happened because there are millions of people that have died from various things. Oh, here's another rocket attack. Here we go. Where is this? Oh, this is on uh, the northern border with Lebanon. You don't see as many rocket attacks up here. And I'm assuming that this is probably an attack from Hezbollah because it's in the north. Margaliot. Let me know if you've ever been there before. <laughs> I doubt anyone has. Okay. So anyway, going back to going back to this, if I can find it. I wouldn't immediately assume that this is some gigantic event that's going to kill a million people in a day or over a couple of weeks. He could be referring to just the, um, the entire collection of things that have happened since that time. So he uh, made this prophecy in 1951, and uh, there's been a lot that's taken place since then. There have been many wars. Wars have increased as well as natural disasters and other things. So, all right, and then continuing, our Heavenly Father has told us how it can be avoided, and that is our mission in part, to go into the world and explain uh, to the people how it may be avoided. End quote. President Smith could not have made that statement except as the Lord revealed it to him. So what we don't know is, uh, have we successfully avoided that? Uh, has this already been taking place, uh, or is it something still yet in the future? And neither you nor I can say that for sure. We can have our opinions, but we can't say that with authority. But this is something to keep in mind. So 1951, millions of people dying like flies. And then the last one that I have uh, for right now, this is the one, uh, the, the prophecy of Spencer W. Kimball, Women in Growth in the Church, in column B right here, I give a, a brief description of the prophecy. So uh, we all know this one. We've talked about it on the channel. Uh, 
This is during the October 1979 General Conference. The talk is called The Role of Righteous Women. And uh, interestingly, it was his wife that read the talk because he was not well. So she was the one that, that read it for him in General Conference. So he says, Finally, my dear sisters, may I suggest to you something that has not been said before, or at least in quite this way. Much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world, in whom there's often such an inner sense of spirituality, will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to the, deg- to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives, and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. Among the real heroines in the world who will come into the church are women who are more concerned with being righteous than with being selfish. These real heroines have true humility, which places a higher value on integrity than on visibility. He's talking about narcissism. He's talking about, do you care more about having like an image of a perfect family to your neighbors, to your community, to the church? Are you more concerned with um, feeling special? Are you more concerned with whatever costume or facade you're, you're choosing to wear? Or when people are not looking, are you more concerned with doing the right thing? Are you a real person or are you a fake person? All right, continuing. Remember, it is as wrong to do things just to be seen of women as it is to do things to be seen of men. Okay, so he's clarifying here. It's not just about uh, attracting the opposite sex, you know, for those kind of benefits. There's people that do things and it doesn't have to do with, oh, I'm, you know, I'm trying to look good for guys or whatever, or, or the, or the reverse guys trying to look good for girls. It's people that seek attention, that seek praise, that seek worship, validation, just all these different things. Are you a real person? You have true values or are you not? Are you just wearing costumes and trying to get people to give you their, their attention? Continuing, great women and men are always more anxious to serve than to have dominion. Yeah, those same people, the ones that are fake, the ones that uh, have facades, they're very interested in control and dominion because they're trying to craft an image and they need you um, to look at them and look at them the way that they need to be seen in their minds. It's, it's easier to accomplish your goals to harvest attention and things like that if you can control the people around you. If you can make your family conform to the image that you need them to portray to the world or or other things. It doesn't just have to be family. It did, there's many different ways that a person may choose to present themselves. So, But a lot of times it, it has to do with control. Do you control people around you? Do you treat them like tools and like puppets because... Uh, you need them to fulfill some some sort of function for you. So great women and men are always more anxious to serve. That means caring about other people, loving them. Or are you someone who controls? All right, continuing. Thus it will be, sorry, thus it will be that female exemplars of the church will be a significant force in both the numerical and the spiritual growth of the church in the last days. All right. And this is uh, this is what was recently um, brought up in the women's session of the, uh, shoot, I think it was the April 2022 General Conference. I could be wrong. But President Nelson, he brought this up in 2015 when he was in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and he's brought it up recently in a video message for uh, the women's conference saying that right now that these are the women, you, you are the women uh, that president, that president Kimball was talking about. So this was a modern day prophecy in 1979 and the women of right now, 2023 are those women. Okay. So we're going to move on from here. If you have any other modern day prophecies given by modern day prophets, 
uh, that are like, that are like this, uh, please send them to me if you don't mind. And then I'll add them and then I'll, uh, give you credit in column G or you can be anonymous. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. So there was somebody that suggest, suggested these three phrases. This is my prophecy fulfillment two spreadsheet where in chronological order, I'm trying to find quotes that have to do with, has this prophecy been fulfilled? Are we still waiting for it to be fulfilled? It has to be done before the second coming or it is the prophecy of the second coming. So I have uh, requested for people to send me suggestions of what to search because it can be said so many different ways. And I had one person that suggested these three has not happened yet, has not occurred yet. And then uh, I shortened this one to happen until like this cannot happen until, or this will not happen until. So I just shortened it to happen until. And uh, surprisingly to my great, to my great surprise, this did not show up at all uh, when I, when I searched it. Um, Again, what I do is I use the scripture citation index. You go to search. Okay. You can search general conference, journal of discourses, scriptural teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. And so in this case, where'd it go? So you do like, for example, has not occurred yet. You have to put it in quotes. So it searches that exact phrase and uh, it doesn't come up. There's nothing there. And I would have thought that at least one of these phrases would have come up. N- not even happen until. Um, actually, I think happen until it did show up, but it was never in reference to prophecy. It was like part of a story or, or something like that. So um, for these th- these three phrases, I've g- I give credit to uh, Jennifer Armstrong and... Uh, I appreciate that. It just, I I guess nothing really, nothing came up. Um, I've started a new column uh, and the phrase is will be fulfilled. Uh, A lot of things came up for this. So it's going to take me a long time probably to fill this all the way out. And I've only come, I've only updated this one so far. It's in yellow because he's referring to uh, not a pro- not something that happens that has to happen before the second coming, but something that happens at the time of the second coming itself. So let me just read you this, and you'll hopefully you'll be familiar with this. Okay, this is Sisters in Zion by President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency. All right, he says, "My beloved sisters, I am blessed to speak during this wonderful time in the world's history." Every day we are approaching closer the glorious moment when the Savior Jesus Christ will come to earth again. We know something of the terrible events that will precede his coming, yet our hearts uh, swell with joy and confidence, also knowing the glorious promises that will be fulfilled before he returns. Okay, so he's talking about something before he returns. What is he referring to? Well, he continues, and I'll show you why I have it highlighted in yellow. As the beloved daughters of Heavenly Father, and as the daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom, you will play a crucial part in the grand times ahead. We know that the Savior will come to a people who have been gathered and prepared to live as the people did in the city of Enoch. Okay, the the city of Enoch. The The people there will be united in faith in Jesus Christ and have become so completely pure. Sorry, the the people there were united in faith in Jesus Christ and had become so completely pure that they were taken up to heaven. Here's the Lord's revealed description of what would happen to Enoch's people and what will happen in this last dispensation of the fullness of times. And in that day shall come, shall come. Okay. In the day shall come that the earth shall rest. But before that day, The heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also the earth, and great tribulations shall be shall be among the children of men, but my people will I preserve. There it is, but my people will I preserve. And righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of mine only begotten, his his resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men. In righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood, to gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth unto a place which I shall prepare in holy city, 
that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou and all thy city meet them there. Okay, this is the key right here. Then shalt thou and all thy city meet them there. And we shall receive them into our bosoms, and they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we shall kiss each other. And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. And for the space of a thousand years, the earth shall rest. You sisters, and this is a this is a quote right here that I have on um, my uh, generations, like specific generations spreadsheet, where there's like generational statements. You sisters, your daughters, your granddaughters, and the women whom... Uh, the women you have nurtured will be at the heart of creating that society of people who will join in glorious association with the Savior. You will be an essential force in the gathering of Israel and in the creation of a Zion people who will dwell in peace in the New Jerusalem. So this is referring to the time of the second coming when the city of Enoch comes and it joins with the church. And so I have that in yellow. So this is the first one that I have. And then I'll fill out more. Okay, now I wanted to read these um, couple quotes on my common misconceptions spreadsheet. The first one has to do with the Antichrist. Uh, both of these quotes come from Millennial, Millennial Messiah. And from this point, we'll be focusing on uh, Bruce R. McConkie and Millennial Messiah and things that have been said about him and about the book. So first, let me read these quotes. Okay. So a common misconception is uh, there's members of the church that believe they've taken the teachings of other Christian denominations that there's going to be a one-person Antichrist that's going to be really powerful before the Savior comes, before the Second Coming. That's not our doctrine. Uh, our doctrine is that there's a great and abominable church. Our doctrine is that Satan is the great Antichrist and that there are many Antichrists but this idea that there's a single person antichrist is not our doctrine. And uh, I have many quotes that refer to that fact right here, just quote after quote after quote after quote. Uh, this is the most recent one. Okay, where'd it go? Here it is. Bruce R. McConkie, Millennial Messiah, pages 50 through 52. We have heard Paul's prophecy announcing that there would be a universal apostasy before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our apostolic, in our apostolic colleague, speaking of the man of sin, and this is a phrase, a title that people consistently misidentify as the single person antichrist that has to appear before the second coming. Speaking of the man of sin, of that evil spirit who acclaims himself as the God of this world, speaking of Lucifer, that's who the man of sin is, it's Lucifer, Paul says, He it is who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Okay? People read this, and they think, oh, there is going to be a man who um, is going to assist in creating the third temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, and then he is going to sit in the temple, and he's going to be this, uh, this like, Antichrist figure. Nope, that's not true. That's not true. This is talking about Satan. Continuing, when Satan enters the church of God, replaces deity in the hearts of men and commands them to worship him when man when men forsake the doctrines of Christ and believe that believe what they hear from false christs plural when they become carnal sensual and devilish by nature and set their hearts upon the things of this world to whose church do they give allegiance christ or satan's when miracles and gifts and revelations cease when men teach with their learning, uh, with their learning, and deny the Holy Ghost who give who giveth utterance, when the love of God and the peace of heaven are replaced with a spirit of lewdness and indecency, whose church is involved? 
the church of the Lord or the church of the devil. Okay? So when we're talking about uh, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, is this referring to the third temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? Or is it talking about the peoples of the earth that should be in the true church, but they're not? They're part of these different other churches or philosophies or ways of thinking, strange paths. Okay, that's what this is referring to. And let me highlight this, church of the devil. And what's the church of the devil? It's the great and abominable church. And the Book of Mormon talks a lot about that. To gain an understanding of how and why the presence of false churches is one of the signs of the times, let us now let us turn now with an open heart and mind to that which is written by the prophets. Our best source material by far comes from the Book of Mormon, whose major pronouncements on the matter we shall consider in their proper settings. Few men uh, have equaled Nephi in seership and prophetic utterance. He saw in vision the birth, baptism, and ministry of the Holy One. He saw the call of the Twelve, the crucifixion of Christ, and the multitudes of the earth joining to fight against the apostles of the Lamb. He saw apostasy and wickedness sweep through the Gentile nations in the day that darkness covereth the earth and gross darkness the minds of the people. As he viewed this day of darkness, this evil day uh, after the apostolic era, he said, quote, I saw among the nations of the earth the foundation of a great church. An angel with whom he, okay, end quote, an angel with whom he was then conversing said, Behold, the foundation of a church, uh, which is most abominable above all other churches. Note it well. There are degrees of abomination. There are levels of iniquity. One church sinks deeper into the cesspool of sin than any other. The angel then described it is, it is, uh, sorry, the angel then described it as the church which, which slayeth the saints of God, yea, in torture. Yeah, and tortureth them, and bindeth them down, and yoked them with a yoke of iron, and bringeth them down into captivity. This is the kind of inspired utterance that is fulfilled over and over again by the same or an equivalent organization. As it happened in the first centuries of the Christian era, so uh, we may be assured it has happened and will happen again in our dispensation. The day of persecution and martyrdom has not passed. And it came to pass that I beheld this great and abominable church, Nephi said, and I saw the devil, okay, the devil, and I saw the devil that he was the founder of it. The man of sin is sitting in the temple of God, demanding worship and proving thereby that he is God. And I also saw gold and silver and silks and scarlets and fine twine linen in all manner of precious clothing, and I saw mer- many harlots, Nephi continued. All right, so there it is. It's, uh, it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear. Do not go to other Christian churches for interpretation of Scripture, you guys. They do not have modern Scripture. They don't have Joseph Smith translations. They don't have living prophets and apostles, and they don't have the spirit of prophecy or the interpretation of prophecy. And you'll end up believing um, false beliefs like that. Okay, the next one has to do with uh, the misconception. The center place or the center stake will be in Salt Lake City, not Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. This is also from Millennial Messiah, page 416. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the, the truth, when remnants of Noah's seed accept the gospel in the last days, and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens will shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven, and possess the earth, and shall have a place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant. Uh, which I made with thy father Enoch. All this is part of the second coming. We shall build a new Jerusalem in Jackson County, Missouri, and Enoch City shall descend and join with it. Okay, that's it. 
So both of these things that I've covered, the Antichrist as well as uh, New Jerusalem being built in Jackson County, Missouri, there are many, 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 many quotes that confirm both of these things. If you ever need to refer to this, I have playlists on YouTube where if you want to watch other videos, you can do that. Or you can come to my spreadsheets and you can copy anything that you need here. I have the quotes, the scriptures, and I have the references. And then you can use it in whatever way you need to, whether it's for your personal study or whether you want to share it on social media, which is probably a good idea because there's too many people that accept uh, these false beliefs when the prophets and apostles have clearly spoken on these matters. Okay, so now um, let's talk about Bruce R. McConkie and the book Millennial Messiah. I've added two new rows on my quotes A through Z spreadsheet. One for Bruce R. McConkie because I want to I want to find out exactly why why it was that he did so much work um, in so much like interpretation of things. I don't really question it. I just want to build it up. So I have one quote so far talking about Bruce R. McConkie. We'll read it in a minute. And then I have one quote talking about the book Millennial Messiah. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it directly from the source where I found it. So the first one has to do with Bruce R. McConkie, and it comes from this article in uh, Church News. Elder, Elder Bruce R. McConkie's son shares his father's legacy. The 24th of April, 2013. And he, he looks like the spitting image of Bruce R. McConkie. Okay. And I just have this one short quote right here. At his funeral, when Elder Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve said, sorry, at his funeral, then Elder Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve said, if ever there was a man who was raised up unto a very purpose, if ever a man was prepared against a certain day in need. It was Bruce R. McConkie. That is pretty powerful. That's coming from uh, Boyd K. Packer. He later went on to become uh, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And uh, that's what he said at, at Bruce R. McConkie's funeral. If ever there was a man who was raised up unto a very purpose, if ever a man was prepared against a certain day in need, it was Bruce R. McConkie. I'm guessing that that has to do with probably many different things, but basically the fact that Bruce R. McConkie was such a, uh, like a scholar of the scriptures. I know that he helped with like the footnotes uh, for the, for the scriptures. Um, and then he's also written many, many different uh, books, including millennial Messiah. Um, he, he's what, like what, I, like what I've said, he's one of the big four, the, the four people, uh, four general authorities that have like uh, expounded scriptures that are typically, typically not talked about by other general authorities. So Orson Pratt and then James E. Talmadge and then Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie. Those seem to me the four main people that have like covered like all the different revelations. And they're basically the only ones sometimes that you can go to, to, hear a general authority's interpretation of a scripture or a certain doctrine. So he's probably referring to that too. Just all, all his uh, basically kind of like scholarly work that he did. Um, okay. So you have that. So I added that to this spreadsheet for Bruce R. McConkie. So now let me take the highlight off and then I'll take the highlight off highlight off of this one. Uh, this row is specifically about the Millennial Messiah, the book. This is actually from um, Elder Holland. Now, this is during a BYU devotional, February 2nd, 1982. And at this time, he was not yet a general authority. He was president of Brigham Young University. Okay. And uh, his talk is called The Inconvenient Messiah. All right. So why did he call it that? All right, he says, oops, many of you are aware and all of you ought to be. Look at that. He says, in all of you ought to be that Elder Bruce R. McConkie has been writing and publishing a series of books on the Savior 
tracing his role in the eternal plan from the councils in, uh, the councils in heaven through his earthly life to his exaltation in eternity. That series of books, entitled in several volumes as The Promised Messiah, The Mortal Messiah, and the soon to be pub- the soon to be published Millennial Messiah, has been a part of my personal study material over these past several months of their publication. And then he goes on to uh, call his talk the Inconvenient Messiah, so as not to steal any of those names. Um, so I think that's really interesting, and I'm sure that that continued uh, once he became a general authority, and I'll show you why. So I just want to point out there that he made this this really interesting statement at a devotional at BYU, in talking about that all of you ought to be aware of this series that he was writing. Uh, by the way, on Amazon, and this is not a paid um, promotion, here are all the books that he's referring to. So I guess as part of the Mortal Messiah, it looks like there's four volumes um, under that title, the Mortal Messiah. And then there's one for the Promised Messiah. And then you have the Millennial Messiah, which is the one that we've primarily been concerned with on this channel. So you can buy the whole set on Amazon. I'm sure you can find it different places. On archive.org, that's the website that I always uh, go to. It's a free online library. Um, They have the Millennial Messiah, and then they have, I think, probably just one of these volumes of the Mortal Messiah. Unfortunately, they don't have the entire thing on there. I wish that they did, but they don't. All right. Now, I want to, the, this, this, the last part of this video, I just want to show you how often and in, in by who um, his book gets quoted. Okay. So the first example that I have is Sister Nelson in a 2016 worldwide devotional for young adults um, broadcast from BYU, Hawaii, in a talk called Becoming the Person You Were Born to Be. This is that really interesting talk where at the end, It's like she gives a hint about Adam Andayaman, where she says, So now a question as I conclude. What if you learned that the Savior had already returned to this earth, that he, as part of his second coming, had already met with some of his true followers in several marvelous large gatherings? And then there's footnote 13. And this this footnote uh, is to the Millennial Messiah. Gatherings about which the world... Sorry, gatherings about which the world, including CNN and the blogosphere, knew nothing. If you found out that the Savior was already on the earth, what would you do desperate? What would you desperately want to do today? And what would you be willing and ready to do tomorrow? Now, from time to time, I get comments on this saying, she's not talking about it happening right now. She's just doing, it's just a hypothetical question. Again, you don't know that, and I don't know that. But I think that we should have this quote on our radar in case she's trying to hint towards something. It, it never ceases to amaze me the people that say, no, that's not what she meant. You don't know. How, how, it, you think that, you, okay. <laughs> Sorry, this is after like two years of people just being like, no, that's not what that means. No, this is, this means this. And then they provide no source in, or there's like situations where there's no possible way that you could say that with certainty because you don't know. And neither do I. That's why we have to rely on people that, that can say things with authority. So the fact that she said this is just something to take note of. That's all. But you go down to footnote 13. Where is it? Do I have to zoom back out to get the, well, okay, whatever. It's, it's this last one here. See, Bruce R. McConkie, the Millennial Messiah, where he talks about, um, essentially, it seems like he's talking about Adam and uh, not only being in the Valley of Adam and although that's where like the main proceedings would take place, but that Christ would go from continent to continent having different uh, conferences, essentially. So, and I've done videos about that before. Go to my playlist called Adam and Ayaman, and I talk about it there. Okay, so Sister Nelson uh, quoted from it. 
And then I did a search on the scripture citation index for millennial Messiah. And um, it's interesting because it's been quoted a number of times, not like a ton, but it's been quoted a few times in general conference. It's been cited, I should say. So the most recent citation uh, is from 2002. And of all people, it was uh, President Nelson, at the time Elder Nelson, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And he cites it right here. Brothers and sisters, these unseen but sure pillars were in place before the world was. They undergird the everlasting gospel, now restored in its fullness. With such a foundation, this church will not be moved from its place, even though even through the millennium. And then there's footnote 29, takes you to Millennial Messiah. You have this one from Carol B. Thomas, 2001. Did you know that spiritual that spirituality is a talent? Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles once said, quote, Above all talents, chief among all endowments, stands the talent for spirituality. And that comes from the Millennial Messiah. And by the way, this was in one of the area devotionals. I don't remember which one. But President Nelson said something where he was talking about how in the pre-mortal life, uh, the greatest gift, the, like the greatest spiritual gift that you could have was the gift of spirituality. And I, I wish that I had that exact quote. Uh, maybe some of you remember that if you watched that devotional. Again, I don't remember which one it was. And um, it was part of that series of devotionals, which were not um, transcribed and only available for a short time. Like if you had the link to, to watch it. I want to see if I can dig into that more. Oh, in fact, I should, I should, I'll add this. I'll add this quote. Well, no, I'll go. Well, yeah, I'll add this quote. And then the one directly from Millennial Messiah about the talent for spirituality. But anyway, that's from Millennial Messiah. Uh, Joseph B. Worthland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. The immortality and eternal life of man is brought to pass by the atonement of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. It is the most transcendent act that ever that ever has occurred or ever will occur among the children of the Father. And he quotes that from Millennial Messiah. Uh, Ezra Taft Benson, president of the church. He says, <clears throat> quote, Few men on earth said Bruce said Elder Bruce R. McConkey, either in or out of the church, have caught the vision of what the Book of Mormon is all about. Few uh, few are they among men who know the part it has played and will yet play in preparing the way for the coming of him of whom it is a new witness. The Book of Mormon shall so affect men that the whole earth and all its peoples will have been influenced and governed by it. There is no greater issue uh, okay, there's no greater issue ever to confront mankind in modern times than this. Is the Book of Mormon the mind and will and voice of God to all men? And he quotes from Millennial Messiah. Um, and then, interestingly, the most recent, it wasn't an actual citation, but uh, again, this is from President Nelson. At this time, He's president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles when he says this. He says, I testify that Jesus Christ is the literal and living Son of our living God. He is our Savior, our Redeemer, our Exemplar, and our Advocate with the Father. He was the promised Messiah. Now listen to this. He was the promised Messiah, the mortal Messiah, and will be the millennial Messiah. I don't think that it's coincidence that he phrased it that way because it just so perfectly matches up with Bruce R. McConkie's series of books, the promised Messiah, the mortal Messiah, the millennial Messiah in president Nelson. That's what he says. He was the promised Messiah, the mortal Messiah, and will be the millennial Messiah. I'm getting the sense that the Nelsons, both president Nelson and sister Nelson hold uh, that book up in, in high esteem. And so I think that we should too, even though there's things in there that only from what I can tell, only Bruce R. McConkie says like little, 
like just little facts or little interpretations of certain scriptures. I'm willing to bet that he's right. Even though he's the only one, um, I'm willing to bet that he's right because you have all these people that are referring to his book, President Nelson. Uh, you have Carol B. Thomas. You have Joseph B. Worthlin, who was an apostle. Ezra Taft Benson, which was a, a prophet. You have um, Elder Holland, who who became Elder Holland after he made that quote. And then on top of that, if you go to the church website and you do a search for Millennial Messiah, here it is right here. I don't know why on my browser for some of these uh, search fields, it like the text is the same color as the box. So I can't see as I type. Uh, I've been, anyway, if you do search for Millennial Messiah, or you could do the Millennial Messiah, you'll come across um, all these different search results, result after result after result, where it's being cited. So for example, here's just like one example right here. This is from mm, the Institute Manual for Doctrines of the Gospel this is Doctrines of the Gospel Student Manual for Institute. This is just so you can see an example. Um, they'll go through, you know, teaching the lesson, and then they uh, draw from different quotes from many different general authorities. But it's very common for these manuals to, to cite the Millennial Messiah by Bruce R. McConkie. And you can see it right here. So you have this right here, Chapter 7, The Creation, Lesson 123, Isaiah, and just look at these, the bold letters right here, the Millennial Messiah, Millennial Messiah, Millennial Messiah, Millennial Messiah, the Millennial Messiah, just so many times, and it never ends, and it's like so many different uh, publications, like church publications. I wish I had some kind of like comprehensive list of everything, because I'm sure that it shows up in... Uh, well, let's look right now. Let's let's do um, the. Let me see if I I got it. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Let's do search, and then let's go to Leahona. Yep, right here. Uh, the July two thousand one Leahona developing our talent for spirituality. Oh no, this is probably just, is this the same person that, let me open this up really quick. Oh, Carol B. Thomas. Okay. So we already read that quote. Um, right here, uh, the August 2001 Leahona. And this is, uh, Dallin A. Jokes. He cites the Millennial Messiah. Here's President Nelson, July 2002. Oh, but that might be the same talk. So yeah, it's been it's uh, come up in magazines. Um, let's see, news and events. I don't know, but anyway. It comes up all the time, and um, many different people cite the millennial, the millennial Messiah. So that's why I feel that it's important to uh, be aware of it and read it if you can. And I'm trying to do my best to pick out the the parts that um, can be used on my spreadsheets for different topics, um, and not not just to focus just on this one book. Uh, you have to look at all of them. Because there's so many uh, books that have been written by general authorities, they all are of great value. It's just that the Millennial Messiah is really just like packed full of doctrine having to do with the second coming. So it's all very interesting. Um, and that's all that I have for you in this one. All right. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.